After the call. Nice to see you. Yeah, I remember you. Of course, Harry. Okay, thank you for coming. Um, if we could get started, it would be great. Um, so, um, feel free to interrupt me at any time to ask questions or just to tell me how you're doing. Um, so let me get started. Um, Jane and I have this new addition to our family. <laughs> She's really cute. She's 10 weeks old, a basset hound, and um, she likes to lick me, but also bite me, so <laughs> we have to cure that habit. <laughs> Anyway, so I just wanted to show you Penelope. We call her Nellie. Um, but she's a great little dog. So, uh, let me go back. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do in an hour is kind of tell you everything that's in my management equality class. <laughs> so that may be a little bit difficult, but I'll, I'll try. And to tell you the important things about quality. So the first question that one asks is, what do we mean by quality? And Joseph Duran, who's, who's gone now, he lived to be about 100, defines quality as fitness for use. You know, Deming's gone, Duran's gone. So those were two of the gurus. So if you're interested in becoming a quality guru, there's room now. <laughs> there's room at the top. Um, so in defining quality, we think of quality of design or technical excellence. So if you compare Ford to Porsche or Mercedes, say, they have different levels of fits and finishes and engines are more powerful and performance is better. So that's one way of thinking about quality. The other way of thinking about quality is in terms of quality of conformance, which means how well does the product or service meet specifications? Um, what about Tesla? Tesla is an interesting case because they have really high technical excellence and really low quality of conformance. Consumer Reports ranks them in terms of quality of conformance at or near the bottom. And it's funny because Musk has written stuff where he's critical of MBAs. And when I read that, I thought, maybe if he took my quality class, he <laughs> Tesla wouldn't be at the bottom. You know? <laughs> so that's just the thought. Um, Dr. Deming had a tremendous influence on quality. He gave a series of lectures to top managers in Japan in the early 1950s. And he told them that if they followed his principles, within five years they would com be competing in world markets. And that's really what happened. 
Um, the Deming Prize is the top award for quality in Japan. And Deming spent a day here lecturing at SOM in 1985, which was really a hoot to have him here. And it's interesting because in 1950, made in Japan basically made junk. If someone came to my house when I was a child and they gave us a gift, we say it was really nice. And then when they left, we'd turn it over and would say made in Japan and we would think junk. But now we know Japanese quality is at the top. So there's been a big change. And it's interesting to see what's going to happen with China, because uh, Korea has also become great. And now we're waiting to see how China becomes. Um, OK. I don't know why this isn't going forward. OK. So here's a picture of Dr. Deming. And there's actually two Dr. Demings. <laughs> the other one was my cat. <laughs> and it's funny because I didn't really like cats at the time. Then I, I started to love them. But my wife said, I said to my wife, what should we knit? She wanted to bring this cat home. Beautiful cat. And a kitten at the time. And my wife said, um, I said to her, what should we name the cat? And she said, how about Dr. Deming? Because she knew I was interested in Dr. Deming. <laughs> so I said, great. So I picked him up at the airport at Tweed. And he was in his late 80s. And he was traveling by himself. And I managed to get him into my car. And I wondered if I should say anything about the cat. <laughs> because you have to realize the Deming Prize is named for him. He had the mail from the Emperor of Japan. And having Swarzy's cat name for him may not be up there <laughs> at the same level. So as we were driving in, a cat ran across the road. And Deming, this is the way he talked. Deming said, that was close. It really wasn't. I wasn't going to hit a cat. But, so I saw my opening. So I said, Dr. Deming, do you like cats? And he said, they're all right. So I decided I'd better back off. So he started asking me questions. I said, you're going to speak to my students who are, who are learning operations management. And he said to me, operations? What's that? So he started quizzing me while I'm driving. Operations? What's that? I said, well, they learn about quality and inventory and production methods. And he said, quality? What's that? Well, they learn. So you, you know how it went. So finally, it's a short drive from Tweed. So we got in and took him to the dean's office. And Bert Malkiel was the dean at the time. And I, I introduced him to Dr. Deming. And he was very gracious. He said, Dr. Deming, Deming, we're honored to have you here today. And we give a degree in public and private management. And sure enough, while I'm eating my bagel and drinking my coffee, Deming said to the dean, management, what's that? So here was the famous Malkiel trying to define management, which is impossible, by the way. So uh, that was the first bit of the day when Deming came. And we had a great day with him. Uh, so just to kind of set the stage, I wanted to talk a little bit about some notable quality disasters. And J&J &J is kind of famous for that. I hope um, if there's anyone working for J&J, &J, I apologize. But um, in August 2008, they had defective Motrum. And instead of having a recall, they sent staff out to buy them all. So all of a sudden, the whole Motrin was gone off the shelves. 
not because of the retail, because they just bought them all. And that continued, um, tainted Tylenol, uh, 135 million bottles of product made in Pennsylvania, and they closed the plant. So just some more ideas about J&J &J recalls. Um, in December 2010, they, they pulled 13 million packages of Rolaids because there was wood and metal particles in them. So they really had a difficult problem with recalls. And as you probably now recall, it hasn't ended for J&J &J because their subsidiary ended up producing contaminated COVID vaccine. Uh, the company is called Emergence, but J&J &J was really responsible. And um, they were contaminated with material from another vaccine. And they had to throw away uh, 15 million doses were scrapped. And the reason for that must have been that they weren't inspecting, or certainly weren't inspecting enough, and they didn't have good process control. So that was J and J. Some of you women in the audience who work out probably remember about um, Lululemon, and. Um, Lululemon had a problem with their, with their athletic pants that were very sheer. In fact, they were so sheer that you could see through them. <laughs> and some of the women who were wearing them were showing everyone their tuchus. Well, tuchus is a, um, is, is a word that means backside. It's Yiddish for backside. And so that was a huge problem. Uh, and they, so when I think about that, how did that happen? Well, they couldn't have been ex inspecting because if they inspected, all they had to do was hold the, the pants up to the light and they would have seen that you could see through them. So that was one of the quality problems that has happened in the last number of years. So the idea of quality is that reducing variation is the main idea. And there are sources of variation in manufacturing, um, plants, uh, processes, machines, workers, suppliers, raw materials. And there are sources of variation in healthcare, hospitals, equipment, physicians, and the different <laughs> procedures. So the idea is you want to reduce variation. Now, Six Sigma is an important word that people hear about all the time. Um, Six Sigma quality problems, and you think about what Six Sigma means. And let me explain what Six Sigma quality means. It's really parts per million. It's really producing a defect level that's really, really small. I don't think anyone's achieving it, but the Six Sigma people would say that that's our goal. And here's a normal bell curve on the slide. And this is an example of Three Sigma quality. So the idea is, if you look at the center line, that's the mean. And the distance to the upper and lower specification limits are three standard deviations away. So that picture shows us that only about three in a thousand items are going to be defective if you're at three sigma quality. So what do you have to do to get six sigma quality? Anybody? What has to happen to the process in order to achieve um, six sigma quality? Anybody know? Don't all speak at once, but <laughs> what do you think? In control. What? In control. Well, in control, yeah, but you want to make the process better. So what does it mean to make it better? Isn't it narrowing the bounds? Yeah, you want to narrow. You want to make the standard deviation smaller. 
So that's a great answer. So this is what this is what six sigma quality would look like, because the distance from the mean to the upper and lower specification limits are six standard deviations away. And that's only five or 10 parts per million that would lie outside the specification limits. So that's what people mean by six sigma quality. So here are the key ideas. So if you had to leave, if, you know, if some of you have your phones and someone calls, um, the next two slides are the most important. So if you get the next two slides, you have my permission to leave, and you sort of get the basic idea. So the basic idea is every process exhibits variation, and there are two sources of variation. The first is called systemic, which is the inherent variability of the process. And the second type of variation is assignable cause variation, which is the result of a specific cause that changes the process. And that's the two type of causes. So systemic variation is due to common, sometimes called chance or systemic causes that lead to the random variation of the process. And assignable causes are something special. You hire someone and that person's not trained and they start making defective product. Or a machine breaks down and it starts making defective product. So that's an example of assignable causes of variation. And it's interesting to think of what percentage of all causes of bad product are assignable causes or common causes. Um, and Deming used to say 80% was these common systemic causes and 20% assignable. And I think when processes start getting better, and I'll give you some examples, then assignable causes take on a bigger percentage. Um, what's this tragic medical example? I don't know if you've heard of it, but a woman was brought to trial, a nurse, because a person was about to go in for a surgery, a woman, and she was very nervous. So they decided to give her a sedative. Instead, the nurse gave her a medication that killed her. And she was brought to trial, which was very unusual, and she was found guilty. And I read it, and actually she was given probation. But I read an article in a medical website where the surgeon said that she shouldn't have been found guilty. I don't think he knew the details of the case very well. And he basically was saying that in medicine, all of the causes of errors are systemic, 100%. He said, you know, she worked long hours, or she wasn't trained as well as she could have been. So it wasn't her fault. But that's really nonsense. Now, I don't know. I think most of the causes in medicine are systemic uh, rather than assignable, but not all. There have to be some cases where there are causes that are outside of the system. And I didn't read the details of this case, but she was found guilty. So I, I don't think you can say that there's one type of cause that's 100%. Uh, and I think in medicine, most of the causes are systemic, uh, but not all, not all. Um, Another key idea is that a process in control is operating at its best. It doesn't mean that it's good. It just means that there are no assignable causes. You, you could tell a guy, a, a friend of yours, you could say he's in control but terrible. 
So he's consistently bad. Uh, so it doesn't mean that if you're in control that you're good. It just means that you're stable. But you could be stable bad. Um, a process that's in control is said to be in a state of statistical stability. The variation is the minimum possible for that process. So if you want to change the variation or reduce it, you have to change the process. My old professor at Columbia, Professor Littauer, he used to feel that the secret to life was getting processes in control. And whenever anyone gave a lecture, he would do two things. And as graduate students, we would kind of nudge each other because Littauer first would fall asleep, and then he would wake up. He had no idea what the lecture was about. And he would raise his head, and he said, I don't know whether this process is in control. Because what he meant by that is if it's not a stable process, you can't make predictions. And the guy who was giving the lecture was making predictions. So that was Littauer. Now, the basic idea of statistical process control is to get critical processes into control and then to make them better. So now, if you have to leave, you can leave because, <laughs> because that's it. Um, important idea in quality is something called foolproof systems, or pokai yoke. And I remember when, in operations when I first taught this idea of pokai yoke. And there was a Japanese student in the class. And I looked at him. Um, Sally's not Japanese. But I looked at him. And I said, now we're going to talk about pokai yoke. I think you're Japanese, right? Yeah. So I said, now we're going to talk about pokai yoke. And he looked at me like, this crazy American is going to speak Japanese, I think. But I don't understand what he's saying. So I looked at him, and I said it again. And I said, we're going to talk about pokayoke. And he said, oh, pokayoke. I thought he said it exactly the same. <laughs> but evidently, he didn't. So, but this is my favorite example on the slide on the screen of pokayoke from Japan. It was attaching labels to cassette decks. They don't have cassette decks anymore. But you can see that the label went on this rectangle. And sometimes, one in 10,000, they put it on upside down. One in 5,000 times. Hardly ever. But the Japanese weren't happy about it because it wasn't 100% perfect. And so they changed the shape where the, where, the, um, where the label went. And so on the right, you can't put it upside down, unless you're a complete idiot. <laughs> and we're, we're thinking they're not going to do that. So that was my favorite pokeyoke. There's a pokeyoke when they have to cut off someone's leg. It's not a great subject, I admit. <laughs> but it used to be that they would put a check on the leg that they had to cut off, or an X. The problem was, if they didn't look at that leg, they might look at the other leg that didn't have anything on it. So they had to do, and they might cut off the wrong leg. Not very often. Very, very uh, rarely. But. So now, when unfortunately, I hope you never have to go for the surgery, obviously. <laughs> but if you ever go, one leg says yes, and the other one says no, or something like that. And that's a foolproof method. Um, another really good foolproof method. OK. So improving service quality. I once went to Brugger's Bagels. I like their bagels. 
And I got the idea of writing a paper on service quality because when I walked in, I went to the counter and I thought the guy was going to say, how may I help you, right? Sounds reasonable. May I help you? How may I help you? Instead, you get the nod of the head. <laughs> it looks something like this. <laughs> it's a <in> motion. <laughs> and usually they look the other way. And it means, what do you want? <laughs> so I told him. And he never said, have a nice day, thank you. And then I checked out. They didn't say anything to me. So I wrote a letter to Brugger's. <laughs> I'm always writing letters because I'm looking for consulting. <laughs> and I said to the president of Brugger's, I said, I went into Brugger's, and if your standard is how may I help you, Thank you. Have a nice day. I didn't hear that once. So basically, you have 100% defective service <laughs> quality. Well, unfortunately, I didn't hear from him, but at least I tried. It was easy. And then I went to Boston Market um, to see what there to buy some chicken. And I was lucky to get out unhurt. <laughs> I mean, they look, they made Brugger's look like Ritz Carlton. Okay. So, so I wrote an article about service quality. And the first thing is you have to identify customers and determine their needs. Define quality and create a quality statement. A quality statement would be great for SOM. It's not just um, training managers for business and society or wherever the, that's a slogan. Uh, a quality statement is a few paragraphs to tell you how you define quality for that organization. And I once worked uh, for Sun uh, Nursing Home Company and I had the groups of people develop quality statements. And I walked around. And at first, they, they wrote things on the white pad. And it was like, um, we keep people safe. Uh, we give them good food. Um, our physicians and nurses are well trained. And I said, that doesn't cut it. You know, you need something better, something with more energy, something that really captures what Sun Healthcare is about. And then people got it, and they wrote, one guy wrote, Sun Nursing Homes, a great place to live. Not to die, to live. And then another person wrote, we treat our residents are like our own family. Can you imagine if you were running a nursing home and you had on your website, we treat our residents like our own family. If they don't treat your family, if they don't treat your family well, you say that's how you treat your family? My mother was in a nursing home and I said to her, to the head of the nursing home, because my mother would hit a bell and they wouldn't respond. And she was very agitated. It was a pretty good nursing home. And I said to the nursing home, I said, I said to the president, I said, how long should they respond? How long should it take? You know what she said? Not too long. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. How about three minutes or five minutes or two minutes, but not too long? You need a standard of what you're going to deliver. And so you have to specify standards and develop quality and performance measures. What percentage of the time do we respond in three minutes? Is it 50% of the time or 95% of the time? So that's the paper that I wrote. Um, 
I did a study of American and Japanese um, printed circuit board companies, and it was the original study had, I guess, seven US firms and six Japanese. Not surprisingly, the Japanese had better quality. Circuit boards, this is a circuit board. It actually has circuitry. Some of them are multiple layers. So the wiring is inside the board. And it could be multiple layers. Very complicated, some of these circuit boards. And the percent scrap was a lot lower for the Japanese companies than for the Americans. One thing that was amazing is customer returns in parts per million. It was hardly any in Japan, but a lot among the American firms. Training hours for engineers in quality control, much higher in the US, a little bit surprisingly. Um, so what did I learn? The quality department plays an important role in Japanese firms. In US firms, they're not important. Uh, the quality engineers aren't important. But in Japan, they're the most important. The best engineers are quality engineers. The second thing, the conventional wisdom says that the line workers are having a lot to do with improving quality. At least in printed circuit board companies, it's not true. They're not. Um, the line workers have responsibility for being accountable and being serious, but they're not working on fixing things. Um, also, quality circles, people thought quality circles were the key to Japanese quality uh, in the early days. And I asked the manager of one of these companies, I said, are quality circles for quality? or for worker morale? Well, you probably know what his answer was. His answer was, it's for morale, it's not for quality. So that was interesting. Um, other, there's less process document, documentation among Japanese firms. The leaders of the best Japanese firms in printed circuit boards are the smartest people, the best engineers, uh, if you want to know who knows the most about making circuit boards, you go to the president. But in the US firms, the president is an MBA or an entrepreneur. So that was a big difference and maybe accounts for a lot of the reason why the Japanese were so great. Okay, I want to tell you about a company I consulted for starting in North Haven in the early 80s for six years. The company was called CircuitWise. I started out working a day a week. Every Friday I went in for six years. I didn't get paid that much, but that was fine because I learned a lot. It's interesting because I knew the theory, but I hadn't done much in terms of practice. And you need to know theory and practice. And so after I took a break after six years and came back for a year or two after, and I came back for two more years, when I started the manufacturing yields, what are the yields? They're a percentage of good product that's coming off the production line. 70%, 30% scrap, some rework, but mostly scrap. And after two years, it was 95%. So we made huge improvement. So uh, it was a great experience for me. And we did training teams and results. Now, when I started my course, I insisted that the president and vice president be in the course. So he said to me, 
what time do you want to start? I said to him, what time do you want to start? He said, how about five? I said, it's a little late. He said, I'm talking AM. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you think, why did he want to start at five? Because the work, the, the class was two hours, and the workers started seven. So he wanted to make sure I was training them on my time, not on their time. <laughs> and so we decided to start at 7 a.m. We started at 7. So we formed quality teams throughout the factory. I gave some lectures to, to the workers. And as I said, manufacturing yields increased from 70% to 95%. And one day I walked into Jack's office, Jack Mettler, and I said, Jack, I am learning so much. He said, you want to pay us? <laughs> well, I didn't want to pay them, but I was learning a lot. But that, he was a wise guy, but I liked him. You know, you know people who are wise guys, and sometimes you like them. <laughs> I'm looking at one of them right now, and I like him. <laughs> um, but sometimes wise guys are, are great. Um, one of the charts that we use for circuit wise was called a P chart. And I'm going to show you. Now, this chart doesn't look so great because uh, it's 40 years old. This is the original chart. And what they did is they took. Production lot was a hundred circuit boards, panels, like this green thing. And so they had this chart. Now the control limits are this line across here. So it's wildly out of control. It's not even close. I mean, look at these points way up here. And they're all assignable causes. Not all of them. Some they couldn't find. But for example, this one was overcured, overcured. It was a process where they were putting the panels through to make sure that the green protective covering becomes hardened, but doesn't get overcured and become brittle. So some of the assignable causes were overcured. This one's interesting because they baked the panels on the lower um, shelf of the curing oven, and it wasn't getting enough heat. So that's not surprising. But again, they save thousands and thousands of dollars just by creating these charts. And the chart was what I call a P chart. And the upper control limit is P bar, which is the total number of defective divided by the total number of samples, just the fraction defective on average, plus 3 square root of P bar times 1 minus P bar divided by N. So it's based on the binomial. You know the binomial. Binomial is like flipping a coin, good or bad. Circuit board is either good or bad, defective or good. And the standard deviation of the binomial is square root of p bar times 1 minus p bar divided by n. So that's the three standard deviation control limits. So you would hope that everything would fall within the control limits if the process is stable if P bar is not changing. But P bar is changing. It's jumping all over the place. It's jumping all over the place. And once they got assignable causes, they could eliminate them. So that was just one example of what happened at CircuitWise. Now, the economics of inspection is an important idea that we applied in CircuitWise. So look at uh, uh, at the decision chart, uh, inspect or don't inspect. 
So you're deciding whether to inspect or not to inspect. You're not deciding whether to take a sample. And if you inspect, it costs you CI, the cost of inspection. So if you inspect an item, it costs you CI. If you don't inspect and it's defective with probability P, because that's the fraction defective, it costs you CD. If you don't inspect and it's good, it doesn't cost you anything. So you remember how to roll back the tree. It's just CD times P. And CI is just the constant. So you set the two things equal, the top or right, top right, and you solve for P. And you get P equals P star, which is CI over CD. So when P is equal to CI over CD, you're indifferent between inspecting or not inspecting. But if P is greater than CI over CD, it pays to inspect. So look at the example I gave. If CI is $10 and CD is $100 and P, the fraction defective, is 12%, then the expected cost of not inspecting is $12. But the expected cost of inspecting is only $10. So for this example, you want to inspect. And so CI over CD, as long as you're greater than 12%, you want to inspect. So it's a very simple idea. Um, when I used to teach this at SOM, I told them, that this simple idea of CI over CD is worth more per minute of teaching of anything you're going to learn at SOM. And I really believe that. And you could print out business cards that say inspection associates, and then on the back you could write CI over CD in case you <laughs> forgot. And then you could go on the beach in California and look for customers and then put a little business card in your pocket and hand them out. <laughs> we do inspection, uh, quality inspection decision making, and we can help you. So anyway, so what was the example we did in CircuitWise? The CircuitWise example saved $700,000. Um, the problem was debris in the panel holes. So these circuit wires, before they put components on them, they have holes. Because sometimes they put capacitors in and put them in the holes. And the holes became clogged with foreign material. And so the inspection was, you just look in the holes. And it takes a few seconds. So the cost of inspection was like nothing. Just look in the holes and see if they're plugged. So that was the cost of inspection. And the cost of inspection was uh, about 10 cents. I, I, they're so small, I don't even know what the numbers are. 10 cents per panel. It was like nothing. But the panels were expensive. They cost $80. And if the material plugged the holes, they got stuck. And you had to scrap the panels. So CI over CD was 0.12, not 12%. 0.12 percent, a, a fraction of a percent, almost zero. And they were producing 9 percent defective. So 9 percent was greater than 0.12 percent. So they should have been doing 100 percent inspection. Instead, they took a sample of size 8. And if they were all good, they said, fine, we'll accept the lot. So if, if this What's the probability of the first one's good? It's 0.91, 1 minus 0.09. What's the probability of the second one's good? 0.91. So you just multiply these 0.91s eight times, and that's the probability that they're all good. And it's about 54%. And the probability that they're defective is 1 minus that, or 46 to uh, percent. So they were basically doing 
did 100% inspection, but only on half the panels, only the ones they rejected. But they should have been doing them all, the whole, 100%. And they would have saved $700,000 a month. They finally fixed the problem after a few months, but it was a great success story. I went to Jack and I said, we just saved 700000 a month. He didn't care. Why didn't he care? Because he learned that making it right the first time is what you want to do and that anyone can expect, inspect. But just because you make it right the first time or try to, you still have to inspect. So CI over CD is really important. So we decided to try for, for the Quality Improvement Award, the Q1 Award. And a year before we applied, Ford came and I showed the guy around the factory. And he said to me, well, Professor, are you doing any Taguchi experiment? Now, Taguchi was a famous Japanese who Ford loved. They loved Taguchi experiments. And I said, no, we're not. I mean, I didn't know everything yet. Now I do, but I didn't at the time. And so uh, I said, no. Well, I could tell he didn't think I knew a lot. So my friend Takamori taught at the university with Taguchi. So the following year, I had lunch with Takamori and Taguchi. And when the Ford guy came back, I said, oh, by the way, I was having lunch with Taguchi. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> so I knew that Ford loves. So this is, they came to do the Q1 survey. And the people at CircuitWise said, we don't want you to present. I said, why not? They said, because we don't want you to, them to think you're doing everything. So I was in the back seat. But I knew that Ford loved gauge capability studies. A gauge capability study keeps me measuring the same product to see that the gauges are stable and to see that they're not increasing the variability, that the, the P over T ratio if you say to me, what the hell is it? I don't remember. It was 40 years ago. So you have to make sure the P over T ratio is below some number. So I, I did this gauge capability study for copper plating. And I put it in my pocket. I had copies of it. And I thought, they love gauge capability. They're going to ask me, where's your gauge capability study? And I, I, I need to be ready. So it was in my pocket. So people did a presentation. And the Ford guy says, the, the two or three or five people say, we want to look at your new process circuit wise. But in the meantime, please prepare a process capability study. I said, Oh, shit. <laughs> Process capability study, huh? OK. So we went into this conference room. He said, we'll give you an hour. We'll give you an hour. And we went into the conference room. And there was a big clock on the wall. And it said, like, 3 o'clock. And we had till 4. And everyone was screaming. Process capability, what's that? What's that? How are we going to do that? We're not going to get the Q1 award. So they, I said, I think I could do it. You can do it. They'll think you're doing everything. I said, can you do it? And they said, no. <laughs> so I said, OK, I'll do it. So I said to one of the workers, I said to one of the people, um, go into the factory and get that chart off the wall for copper plating, the control chart. Because we had one, of course. And we started to calculate uh, 
the Process Capability Index. So let me tell you what that is. Uh, so here's a gauge capability. Here's a gauge capability study. So CPK is the Process Capability Index. So CPK is equal to Z min divided by three. So look at that picture. I have a curve that's showing the distribution of the product characteristic. And the upper spec limit is at three standard deviations. And the lower spec limit is at three standard deviations. So if you have a normal distribution, you want the process mean to be in the middle, to have the smallest amount falling outside of specifications. So the distance, the z-score from the mean to the standard to the standard deviation limits is three. So CPK is three divided by three, or one. So that's the magic number for four. CPK is equal to one. So I knew that they wanted CPK. They were pretty good for it, to tell you the truth. They wanted CPK to be one. So, and this picture shows CPK is equal to one. So if I shrunk the variability, CPK would get bigger, like in the Six Sigma example that I did. But this is an example of CPK equals one. So I said, get that chart off the wall. And it has all the measurements of the copper plating thickness. And figure out what the CPK is. So take each measurement, take the mean, measure the distance in standard deviation units, calculate the standard deviation, and figure out what CPK is. Meanwhile, the, the freaking clock is ticking. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's 15, it's, it's 20 after. And this guy is fooling around with this chart. So I said, what's CPK? Because I taught him how to calculate it. He said, 0.85. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> 0.85? Really? So I said, I said, you know, CPK is based on a normal distribution. But copper plating is skewed. So you don't have a normal distribution. So you don't want the mean to be in the center. You, you want it to be further away from the tail. So you're not producing defective product. You want to be closer to one spec limit, which is why we got 0.85. And so I said, take all the 100 data points, it's 25 after, 330, put it in a histogram, and let's look at what the distribution is. And lo and behold, as I like to say, all the points were within specifications. So even though CPK was 85%, we were still within specification. So the CPK of 85% was misleading because we didn't have a normal distribution. So I said, I'm all set. So I went into the men's room, the, the, the bathroom, and I wiped my face. I poured water on my face, I straightened up my tie, I said, I'm ready. <laughs> so these two guys come in. So I said, the first thing you have to do is a gauge capability study. So I passed it out, I passed it out. <laughs> so they're looking happy, gauge capability study. I said, you know, in P over T, whatever that means, I didn't say that, but... <laughs> is within the number that it's supposed to be. And I said, and so we calculated CPK, and it was 0.85. So they looked at each other, like, 
we got this guy. 0.85, they're not getting Q1 with a 0.85. Forget it. So I said, and I'm surprised I said this, because it's not my style. <laughs> but I looked at the two guys and I said, it's 0.85, but as you know, I knew they didn't know. I said, I said, <laughs> I was on a roll. I said, I said, as you know, CPK is based on a normal distribution. I don't think they knew that. And we don't have a normal distribution. And I showed them the histogram. I said, the data is skewed. And even though the CPK is only 0.85, all the points are within specifications. So I was flying. Like, I had just hit a home run with the bases loaded in the seventh game of the World Series. <laughs> and I didn't even have to say, are there any questions? You know? I just said, thank you very much. And I, that was it. They, you know, that was it. So. About an hour, they had a meeting deciding whether to give us the Q1 award. And afterwards, the manager said, they told us that CircuitWise was going to get level two award. But because of Swarzy's presentation, we're giving you the Q1 award. The flag, the whole, the plaque, everything we've been working for three years, two years, hard for. I was so excited. The Jack Mettler never said anything to me. I didn't care. He didn't say, good job, or nice going. I was driving in my car. I was jumping up and down on that seat. My head was practically hitting the roof of the car. I was so excited that we got that award. And it was, you know, it was a great, uh, a great experience. So I just wanted to tell you that. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Some things I remember, they said, you need, you need to come back. I got a call after I left after six years. And a manager said, we need you. You need to come back. I said, OK, I'll come back. And I had realized that they were listening to what I was saying, and that I could tell them what to do. I was just a consultant. You know, consultants don't tell you what to do. So I would say, do that, do that, do that. You know, collect that data, do that. Let's do that. Um, one day, I was in the plant on the third shift. And I was wearing a suit and a tie. And people were looking at me, what's this suit doing here at 3 o'clock in the morning? And my wife called um, the guard desk. She said, I think my husband's there. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. A couple of years after I finished, I walked into the plant, and I went into a room. And there was a guy sitting in the, po in the corner, one of the workers. And he was not looking at me, because I knew he wanted to see, did I recognize him? Did I know his name? And I thought, is his name Frank? <laughs> I'm not that great on names, but my father's name was Frank. <laughs> so I said, it's got to be Frank. <laughs> so I walked over to the corner, and I said, how you doing, Frank? I didn't say, are you Frank? I said, how are you doing, Frank? He lit up. It was unbelievable. <laughs> he was so happy that I recognized him, that I knew his name. And that is so important, that you have that kind of relationship with the people who are working for you. Around the same time, I went back to the cafeteria and there was a Latino woman, Maria, who was a great worker. And she paid me a compliment. 
Jack Mantler never paid me a compliment, <laughs> but I didn't care. And she said to me, you know, you really helped this company. And that was second 